How are you? Welcome to another online children's message. I am teacher Bianca and I will be your new teacher. I am very excited to be with you today. Easter Sunday is right around the corner and I wanted to show you something. What is this I'm holding? It's a golden crown. Very good. That's right. It's a golden crown. A golden crown that has diamonds around it, right? And it's very fancy. It's very shiny. <laughs> and this is actually worn by kings who live in a palace. Who wear fancy capes or fancy clothes. Did you know that I know a king who does not wear a golden crown and who does not live in a big beautiful palace and he doesn't wear fancy peeps or fancy clothes either. This king saved the world and it is Jesus. Yes. Jesus is our King. So, are you ready to hear the story of Easter on how Jesus entered Jerusalem? If you're ready, say, Jesus is our King. Very good. Now, here's the story. At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses, when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. Jesus and his disciples stopped in the town. You coming? And Jesus told two of his disciples to go on ahead of them. Eh, okay. He told them to go into a village and that they would see a young donkey that no one had ever ridden. Rock! He told them to untie it and bring it to him. If anyone asks, what are you doing? He told them to just say, the Lord needs it and we'll return it soon. Okay, go ahead. So the disciples did what Jesus said and brought him the donkey. A long time ago, before Jesus was even born, God had said that the Savior, the King of Israel, would come to Israel in this way. And now Jesus was doing just as God had said. The news that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem swept through the city. Many heard about all the amazing things he had done, so they cut palm branches and ran to see him. Huh? The Pharisees and religious rulers realized that there was nothing they could do, for everyone was going to see Jesus. Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem and the crowd spread their coats on the road ahead of him. His followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. The Pharisees were upset and they told Jesus to stop the people from saying things like that. But Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. So the people kept on singing, Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered, asking, Who is this? And the crowds replied, It's Jesus. And Jesus rode the donkey through the street of Jerusalem to the temple in a triumphal entry just as God said he would many years before. It's a great story to tell, isn't it, kids? Jesus, our King, humble and caring. He don't even wear fancy clothes and don't even live in a big palace. But Jesus was really glad when he saw his people using their coats uses palm branches just to make a carpet for him and he was very happy when he hear his people praising him for what he has done for the things or for the good things and miraculous things he has done for them jesus wanted to help everyone 
And he did. He saved the world. He came to earth to serve, not to be served. And we learn from this story that Jesus is not just a healer or miracle worker. He is also a humble king who went down to earth to save us. Let us remember that Jesus is with us. We can share this with our loved ones, kids. That Jesus is our king and he saved us. Can you go to your mommy and daddy and spread the good news? Tell them that Jesus is our king and he saved us from our sins. Shall we dance together? Come, let's go. from Luke chapter 19 verse 38 blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest let's pray dear Jesus thank you for being our king and our Savior teach us to be humble and love others as you do remind us that you are always there for us and your love is unconditional. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye kids! See you next week!
Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the fountain of all wisdom, knowledge, and revelation, the source of life, the God who created all things. As we come to start our online worship service today, first of all, allow us, Father, to express our deep gratitude, precious, and honor to you for all the wonderful things you have done in our lives. Indeed, it is so amazing that even though we are threatened by the fear of uncertainties and hard times, yet in any manner, you are always here with us, providing us comfort and spiritual strength and most especially our daily needs. Thank you for giving us the modern technology where we can continue for the time being to hold our weekly online worship service in all the bad times like this by all the ways and means those who have deep desire to know you more must always find a way as you always provide us the way 
amid this current problem we face, help us, Father, to realize the most important thing that we need to remember that even we endure in this life, we are all safe and secure in your loving embrace. This is the reality. We should take note that no one can snatch us away from your hand. Thank you, Father, for the message and the messenger you provide for all of us today. May you into us with the spirit of wisdom that we will be able to understand and be enlightened by your will to be done so we can participate in your plan, purpose, and work here on earth what you already up to for your glory. So at this time, we now submit to you, Father, the proceeding of our online worship service today for your spiritual blessing. Thank you. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who absolutely possesses all power and authority in heaven and on earth forever and ever. Amen. I have a friend who worked for a manager known for making the whole department miserable. The manager was such an oppressive boss that when she announced she would be leaving the company, the staff struggled to hide their joy as she served her two-week notice. But they were able to secretly plan a going away party for the manager's last day on the job. Only they did not invite the manager. Once she went away, they threw a party. Well, that's not usually what we're trying to do when we throw a going away party. Typically, we mean to celebrate the person who's going away, not the relief of their going. But consider this, when we celebrate Palm Sunday and Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we are in a way doing a little of both. If you remember the story, Jesus is entering Jerusalem when the city erupts into celebration as they think Jesus is coming to overthrow the Romans. So, they are celebrating the person of Jesus. But Jesus did not come to Jerusalem to conquer the Romans. He came to die on a Roman cross. Little did the inhabitants know they were throwing Jesus a going-away party. And it's a going-away party worth throwing. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave the oppressive rule of evil, sin, and death its two-week notice. This present evil age is on its way out. Hallelujah! Like those who celebrated the departure of an oppressive boss, we can celebrate the departure of the oppressive rule of evil and sin that has long tormented our souls. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he entered to triumph over the devil's rule of darkness and fear, bringing us into his light and love. Listen to these words of celebration often read on Palm Sunday. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is is good. His love endures forever. As we celebrate Palm Sunday, may our praise and joyous worship be a response of overflowing gratitude for who Jesus is and what he has done. Not overthrowing cities and rulers, but conquering sin and death and reigning in our lives. Hosanna, Hosanna. I'm Greg Williams, speaking of life.
Do you believe you've made some mistakes in your life? Do you believe you've done some wrong things? Would you like to be forgiven for all those mistakes and wrong things? Well, how can you know for a certainty whether God has forgiven you or not? Are you sure? Well, today we're going to look at a sermon given by the Apostle Peter that deals with the question of God's forgiveness and how you can be certain you have received it. We're going to look at Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. But first, we need to get some background and context that, that led up to Peter's sermon. You may remember that in Acts chapter 10, we find Peter in the city of Joppa, where he has a vision. In this vision, he hears a voice from heaven, a voice from the Lord that tells him of all things to eat unclean animals. When Peter objects to eating unclean animals because it's forbidden by the law of Moses, the voice from heaven tells him, don't call unclean what I have made clean. So Peter doesn't know quite what to make of all this. And then the next day, Peter is invited to travel to Caesarea to the home of a Roman soldier who's an uncircumcised Gentile and therefore considered unclean by Peter and most of the, his fellow Jews of the day. But Peter has come to believe that he's experiencing something from God and he's trying to figure out exactly what it is that God wants him to do and what is God telling him. Well, when Peter gets to Caesarea and he meets the Roman soldier Cornelius, and not only Cornelius, but Cornelius has invited not only his family, but all of his relatives and all of his friends. So there's quite a gathering there of uncircumcised Gentiles when Peter arrives. So the first thing Peter does is explain to the group, you know, it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit the home of an unclean Gentile. But I think God is showing me not to call anyone, anyone unclean. Peter then asked Cornelius, okay, so why have you sent for me? And Cornelius explains a number of things, but he responds that he and his entire household, uh, family, friends, and maybe even the servants, <clears throat> are in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded Peter to say. So Cornelius, though he's an uncircumcised Gentile, is obviously someone who has devoted himself to the worship of the God of Israel and to be, as far as he knows, a good person. And he believes that God has sent Peter and he believes that whatever Peter is going to say is from God and he and all of his friends and family are ready to listen. So with this, Peter begins his sermon. So let's look at Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Acts 10, verse 34. Now, Luke writes this, and here's how Luke begins the speech. And by the way, what Luke does here is really, in Peter's sermon, lays out Luke's entire understanding of the gospel message. And in that, he actually follows very closely the entire pattern of the gospel of Mark. So Luke begins the story this way. Then Peter began to speak. Now, literally in the Greek that says, and Peter then opened his mouth. Now, that's a way of saying this is important. This is profound. This is the way proclamations from God in the Old Testament are given. So this is a very sobering, a very a formal way of introducing a message. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. This is something new for Peter. <laughs> He's just beginning to realize this. I mean, for Peter, uh, 
the Jewish people are God's people. They're special. God loves the Jewish folk. And the rest of the folk, not so much. But he's being challenged on this issue and his way of thinking. So Peter says, I now realize how true. It's, this is the truth. God, now who's in charge here? God, we're going to see that throughout. God is in charge. That God does not show favoritism. God does not show partiality. And what he means by that is that God does not look on the external appearance of a person and show partiality. And the, the expression he uses uh, comes from the Greek that uh, someone who would be bribed, a judge or an official could be bribed, or you would offer money, or you could blackmail someone and they would become partial. God's not that way. You cannot influence God with external qualities of a human being. God does not show favoritism. God is impartial. But God accepts, and the word in Greek used here is dektos, which means both ritually and morally. In other words, without ritual and without behavior, but he accepts you totally. He accepts people from every nation. And the word there is from, from the root word ethnos and is generally used in the Greek Old Testament to talk about Gentiles. So what he's saying here is that God does not show partisanship. God is, does, is impartial. God does not show favoritism, but accepts, really apart from rituals and apart from behavior, accepts from every nation, all the Gentiles, the one who fears him. Now, what does it mean to fear him? Well, Luke has a term that he uses often, God-fearers. This is not exactly that term, but it's very similar, and it conveys the same idea as these are Gentiles who worship the God of Israel. And in many cases, the people that Luke calls God-fearers attended synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they kept the moral precepts of the law of Moses. They didn't practice dietary rules. They didn't practice rituals. They didn't perform sacrifices. They didn't do many of those things. But when it came to worshiping God, the God of Israel, and trying to be a good person insofar as they understood what that meant, that's what they did. So God accepts these Gentiles who fear him, who respect him, who are in awe of him, and do what is right. And the expression there uh, has literally to do with the giving of alms. And you might remember, if you've read Acts chapter 10, that Cornelius was a devout man who worshiped God and gave alms, gave donations to the poor in the Jewish community. He helped people out. As a Roman centurion with a large house, he probably had some money. And he was very generous with that money and tried to help others. So this is what stands out about Cornelius. He's not only an uncircumcised Gentile, remember, but he's also an officer in the army of the occupying force. Now, if anybody's an enemy of the people, it's Cornelius. And yet he worships God. He perhaps even attended synagogue. And he helps the poor. This is a devout, sincere man, though he's an uncircumcised Gentile and though he's an officer in the occupying military. So Peter continues in verse 36. You know the message, the logos, what Jesus taught, the word of God, what Jesus taught, the message from Jesus. So Peter assumes and Luke assumes for his reading audience that Cornelius and perhaps even his family and friends, are aware of Jesus. And they've, they've heard what Jesus has done, and they've heard what Jesus has taught. So Peter assumes this knowledge that they have, and he says, you know the message that God sent to the people of Israel. Even though you're Gentiles, you've heard the message. 
Perhaps you've been to synagogue, or maybe you've just heard the news, but you know. Announcing the good news, the, the gospel, the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. Well, what kind of peace? The peace of God. Maybe you've heard of the peaceable kingdom, the messianic kingdom. And what Peter is saying here, he's preached the good news that that peace, that peaceable kingdom, the messianic kingdom has already come in Jesus. And that now you have peace. You may be a Gentile and I may be a Jew. And maybe culturally we're not supposed to like each other. And in fact, I'm not supposed to be in your house. And God forbid I should ever share a meal with you. And yet here I am. The enmity is gone. As Paul would put it, the middle wall of partition is down. There's peace between Jew and Gentile. And between the Roman occupying soldier, the military man, and the people that the Romans were oppressing, there's peace. God, through Jesus Christ, has made peace. So the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now here is a deeply Christological message, as we would say. Lord, and in this context, that means deity. That means God. That means ruler. Who is Lord of how many? How many, church? All. He's the Lord of the Jewish people. No, he is the Lord of all. What about sinners? All. He is the Lord of all. That, that's so important. In him, he's made reconciliation between those who are enemies and those who are foes and those who are of different races and different cultures and different ethnicities. And he has brought them all into reconciliation and peace. He is Lord, God, master, ruler of all. Even wicked people? Yes, he is Lord of all. Now, all and everyone are going to be two very important words in Peter's sermon. Then he continues in verse 37. You know, okay, again, what does Peter assume here? He assumes this audience knows this already. In other words, why would they uh, have been praying? Why would Cornelius have had a vision? Why would Cornelius have asked Peter to come? Why would all of his friends and neighbors come to hear Peter? They know. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. You know this. In other words, this is a matter of historical record. This is a matter of fact. This is a matter that has been widespreadly, widely spread through all the countryside. Even though you're up here in Caesarea, you know and have heard all of this. And just like Mark's gospel, where does the ministry of Jesus begin? With the baptism of John and then moves forward. So, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God, who's in charge? God, this is a God thing, how God anointed, creo, that's the verb, we're familiar with the noun, Christos, Christ, the anointed. What's the Hebrew word for anointed? Messiah, right, the Messiah, the Christ. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth at his baptism when the Holy Spirit came upon him for all to see so that people recognize this anointing, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, dunamis, power, power connected to the outflowing of the Holy Spirit from the person of Jesus. The Holy Spirit and power. And how did that power flow out from Jesus? Signs, wonders, miracles, and how he went around doing good. Now that's an important word because in the Greek, we might translate it more literally into uh, uh, English as benefactor. 
Now, in the Greek culture, if you were a benefactor, you were a great man, you were a hero. You were like Hercules or somebody. You were a hero because you were a benefactor. And what's the worst thing that could be done to a benefactor? Kill them. And there were severe penalties for anyone who killed a benefactor. And Jesus is the benefactor of all people. And yet, they killed him. So, he went around doing good and healing all. How many? All. Healing all who were under the power of the devil, who were being oppressed by the devil. He set the oppressed free. He set them free. He healed all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Who's in charge? God. And how do we know that Jesus is from God? He says, here's the proof. You know what he did in the power of the Spirit. He healed the sick and he cast out demons and he did good things. Miracles, signs, wonders, proving that he is the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah, the one from God, the one whom God sent. Verse 39, we, talking about himself and the people who were with him, the other apostles, the Jewish folk who had become followers of Jesus in Jerusalem and the areas around that. Remember, he came from Joppa with a delegation of believers. We are witnesses. This is proof. We testify to it. In the mouth of two or more witnesses, let everything be established. Peter is saying this is established. This is a fact. You can't deny this. We're witnesses to it. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews, probably meaning the entire area of Palestine, and in the city of Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they killed him by hanging him on a cross. We saw it. We knew it happened. From, we'd fled, but from a distance, we know, we know what happened. They killed him, hanging him on a cross. The Greek word there is actually tree. And maybe your translation says they hung him on a tree. And, but the word tree, or it could be translated wood, was the common symbol and understanding for the cross. So they killed him by hanging him on a cross. Now, why was that? Well, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verse 23, it says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So according to Jewish law, Jewish teaching, was Jesus, did he look like the Christ? Did he look like the Messiah? No, he looked like someone God had cursed. He looked like the lowest form of criminal. Now, many have argued that you can prove that this happened to Jesus because no movement would write about how their leader was treated like a common criminal and embarrassed and cursed under the law and hung on a tree. Uh, no one wants to say that about your leader, and yet they could not deny it. It had happened. It was true. They were witnesses of it. So God, they hung him on a cross, but God, who's in charge? God. But God raised him Jesus, from the dead on the third day. On the third day. Crucified on Friday, in the tomb all Saturday, and raised on Sunday, on the third day, and caused him to be seen. Eyewitness account caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God, who's in charge? God, whom God had appointed. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, designated, and pre-appointed. And that included not only the apostles, but the women and others. And according to the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, over five 
hundred believers saw the resurrected Jesus after he was crucified, after he was entombed. They saw him out of the tomb alive again. They are the witnesses to the resurrection. And, as Peter adds, and by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Now, why do you think that's important? Was this some phantom? Was this some spirit thingy? Was this some delusion? Something they imagined? Was it a dream? No. Why? We sat down and ate and drank with him. We saw the resurrected Jesus eat food and drink beverage. He's alive. He's real. The same Jesus who went into the tomb is the Jesus who came back out of the tomb. And we sat and ate with him. And if you remember the resurrection stories, when Jesus appeared, what usually happened? They had a meal. Of course, what do you do? When Jesus appears, you have a meal. And the early church began to say, to experience the risen Lord, we need to have a meal. We need to have it in common. We need to have communion. We need to eat together on the road to Emmaus, as Luke tells us. They didn't know who Jesus was, but then they recognized him how? In the breaking of the bread, in the eating of a meal, they recognized Jesus. Can you see how the early church, by the time the apostle Paul wrote what he did about the Eucharist or the communion, the church was already having meals. Because what happens when the church comes together and has a meal? Guess who shows up? Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. He's there with us in the breaking of the bread and the eating together in communion. So this was a tradition that started very early, and then the Apostle Paul modified it for the church in 1 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> so he's real. That's the point. He's, he's real, a real living, <laughs> alive person. The same person we used to know he is alive again. Though he's got a spiritual body, he is real. Verse 42, he, Jesus, commanded us to preach to the people, to the people of God, the Laos, the people of God, not just the Jewish people anymore, but all the people of God, as Luke likes to refer to them, the restored Israel. There's a new Israel, and the new Israel is made up of, guess what, Jews and Gentiles. They are the restored Israel. They are the people of God. So he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed. Who's in charge? God. Whom God appointed. God designated. God decreed as judge of the living and the dead. Now, Jesus is Lord of the living. That makes sense. But the dead, no, not so much, right? Right? No, he is Lord of all, the living and the dead. You know what? The dead, that's not the end of the story because he's still Lord. He is the Lord if you're living and guess what? He is the Lord if you're dead because he is Lord of all. Peter continues. All the prophets testify about him. This is not some new thing, really, when you understand the prophets, when you understand the Hebrew scriptures properly through the lens of Jesus. They all speak about him. They speak about the Messiah. They speak about the Messianic age. They talk about the age of peace, the age of reconciliation, the age of forgiveness. The prophets speak about this when you properly understand it. All the prophets testify, bear witness again. This is the fulfillment of what they prophesied about. It's all fulfilled in Jesus. He's the one. Remember it on the road to Emmaus when Jesus explained to the two travelers that he was with and showed them out of the law and the prophets that they all the scriptures spoke about him. 
all the prophets testify, bear witness about him, that almost everybody, what does it say, church? All, oh, everyone, everyone, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone. Everyone who believes who he is. Who is Jesus? You know who Jesus is. You begin to receive the forgiveness of your sins. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you believe, it becomes real for you. Jesus died for all people. Jesus died for everyone. When you believe that, you know it as a fact that it has happened. You know you're forgiven. You know you're forgiven. Everyone who believes in him, you say, yes, now I know Jesus. Now I know who he is. I know what he has done. I know what he is doing. And I know what he's going to do. And I know by knowing that that I am forgiven. Everyone who believes in him receives or takes, takes hold of the forgiveness of sins. Oh, can you guess, church, what the word there is for forgiveness? It's a form of our favorite word, offices. It's a form of offices who receives offices. Forgiveness, letting go getting rid of, sending away forgiveness. They receive forgiveness. It's as though it never were. Forgiveness of sins through his name, by the authority, the person, the identity of knowing who Jesus is and accepting him as Lord of all and your savior from your sins. Response and acceptance Okay, where does it here say anything about uh, sacrifices? Keeping the Sabbath? Keeping the Ten Commandments? No. What do you do? Believe. Believe in Jesus and accept him as your Savior. And Jew or Gentile or whoever you are, you know that he's forgiven you. And you have forgiveness in his name. Now... Okay, what do we learn from this account? It's time for some heavy-duty theology here. You ready, church? You can fill in the blanks. Are you ready? Jesus is Lord of all. Boy, if we learn nothing else today, that's one thing we all know. Jesus is Lord of all. Guess what? All things in heaven and on earth. Time. Space, matter, he's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of the living and the dead. Lord of all, all people, saints and sinners. God loves everyone and wants everyone to have eternal life and an eternal relationship with him. That's what God wants for all, all humans, all that have ever been and ever will be. That's what God wants for us. All and everyone are so important in Peter's sermon. We also realize God does not show favoritism or partiality based on race, color of skin, ethnicity, nationality, or gender. God wants all people to believe in him and to respond to his love by coming into a relationship with him. Guess what, folks? No one is off limits. No one is off limits for God. And we recognize that Peter pro proclaimed as a historical fact that Jesus ministered with healings, exorcisms, and the preaching of the gospel throughout the region of Judea and Galilee in the first century AD. And that fact was well-established and well-known throughout the region. 
you know, those who say, well, I'm not sure Jesus ever really existed. Well, something happened. The greatest sociological movement in the history of humanity happened right around that time and right around in that area and began right there and spread all over the world to it's the largest single religion in the world to this day. Something happened. I think pretty good witness to the fact that it was Jesus is what happened. Peter proclaimed that all the Hebrew prophets and scriptures testified to the forgiveness of sins through Jesus the Christ the Messiah. Not through animal sacrifices, not through rituals, not through one's genealogy through Jesus. So, Jesus is Lord of all. And as Lord of all, he is Savior of all. Church, do we get that? If he's Lord of all, Jesus, which means Savior, is Savior of all. Jesus died for all. In Jesus, all have been forgiven. All their sins. I like that. All have been forgiven of all their sins. All have been made clean. Jesus' life and death, his atoning sacrifice is, hear me church, unlimited. It does not apply to the few. It applies to the all. It applies to the all. So, how do you get forgiven? How can you be sure you've done the right thing to have your sins forgiven by God? Have you done enough? Have you made a decision which triggered the work of Jesus into effect? How can you know? In Jesus, God has forgiven every one of their sins. Yes, <laughs> the worst people ever, you and me. The worst folks he has forgiven. There's nothing you or I can do or need to do to make it happen. It has happened. It has happened. You have been forgiven. Jesus lived and died and was raised again. It happened and you are forgiven, it has happened. It is finished. Ah, so we do nothing? Hmm. What do we do? <laughs> Believe. Except that it's so. Believe it. Respond to it. Experience it. If you don't believe it, you will not experience it. If you don't believe it, you will not experience it. Doesn't mean it isn't so. Doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Doesn't mean it isn't true. It means you won't experience it because you don't believe it. You live in denial. If you don't believe it, you will not experience it. You will not consciously receive it or take hold of it, even though it is real and true. Okay, logical question. So how does one come to believe it? Huh. I got the answer. That is the sovereign, distinctive, and mysterious work of the Holy Spirit. Sip. Pastor Dave, what, what do you mean, mysterious? Well, you look up the word mysterious in a concordance and you look through the Gospels and you look through the epistles of Paul and tell me I'm wrong. Have you not read how the Holy Spirit is like the wind? Don't know where that came from. Don't know where that went. I just know what happened. But it is, sisters and brothers, the sovereign, distinctive, and mysterious work of the Holy Spirit to where someone comes to Believe. 
But I submit to you that the Holy Spirit is out there and he's blowing like the wind. And he's working on us humans. And he's there. And a lot of it has to do with, do we pay attention? Do we listen? Do we hear? Do we respond? And as we begin to hear, to listen, to respond, the realization comes upon us. Like Peter said, I'm beginning to realize this. Well, how was he beginning? Well, the Holy Spirit was beginning to work on him. I begin to realize this. How did Cornelius ask for a visit? Well, he was praying and worshiping and trying to be good to his neighbor. And he was responding to what he knew. And he may have not even known about the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit knew about him. And the Holy Spirit was working on him. And he finally says, oh, Lord, I need to ask Peter to come up here and, and explain all this to me. Because I believe, I believe he responded and the belief increased. Know this. Today you're hearing this sermon. You're hearing Peter's sermon. You're hearing what? You are forgiven. That's what you're hearing. No matter who you are, no matter what you've ever done, you are forgiven. And the Holy Spirit is calling out to you through this sermon today and through the sermon given by the Apostle Peter, the Holy Spirit calls out for you to know that. Now, what do you do? Believe. Respond to the love of God in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Now, the gospel is not about behavior. Thank God. It's not about getting things right. Thank God. And doing the right things in order to be forgiven. Thank God. However, believing in Jesus and that you are forgiven by God will result in, guess what, a change of behavior. When you know how much God loves you and how he has forgiven you and how Jesus died for you because he loves you so much, how do you respond? As we grow in love for God through the power of the Spirit, as we grow in awe and worship of God, we will more and more believe. And as we believe more and love God more, guess what? We'll love our neighbor more. We will grow in love for our neighbor through this process. This will promote and lead to growth. Growth in our morality, growth in our behavior, growth in our ethics. Oh, fellows, folks, sisters, brothers, we will be changed. We don't change to be forgiven. We're forgiven. Oh, God, we respond and we change because we are forgiven. We grow. We have a desire through the Holy Spirit to do, remember what it said about Cornelius? To do what is right. To do what is right. To walk as Jesus walked. That fills your heart, that fills your mind, that fills your core. And it's a growth process, but it is a process that leads to loving God and loving your neighbor more and more and more. Know this, Jesus is Lord of all and judge of all. Oh, how's he going to judge us? <laughs> God loves us. That's how he's judged us. God loves us. God has forgiven everyone. Can you believe that? God has forgiven everyone, including you and me. You are forgiven. Believe it. Respond to it. Live it out. Thank God for it. Live out your life in the experience of God's love and His certain and absolute grace and forgiveness. It will make a difference in your life it will make a difference in how you live and love your neighbor. Don't you think your neighbor ought to hear about this? Don't you think your neighbor ought to hear that they've been forgiven? 
Don't you think your neighbor ought to know that they're set free, that they are delivered? And they may not know it. Well, if you don't know it, it's like still being in jail until someone says, you're not in jail, you're free. Are you sure? Yes, you have been freed. Live it out. So we know we've been forgiven, but we know others need to hear that too. Let's tell them about it so that they too can know Jesus is Lord of all. And God, through Jesus Christ, has forgiven everyone. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Jesus has given himself to us, and we have forgiveness, reconciliation, and fellowship with God through what Jesus did. We remember in a way that we know by the grace of God, we are the people for whom our Savior died and rose again. We are the people whose sins Jesus confessed on the cross. We are the people with whom God has made a new covenant in the blood of Christ. We are to whom God said, I will be your God and you shall be my people. In partaking of the bread and wine or juice, remind yourself that Jesus assumed your body of flesh, your mind, your spirit, sinful though they be. Sanctify them in his own person, and Jesus gives back our life to us, converted and regenerated in him. We are receiving a great gift. Let us pray. Dear God, as we take the bread representing your life that was broken for us, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to us and to all who will receive you. We can't begin to fathom the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion. Yet you took that pain for us. You died for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your extravagant love and merited favor. Thank you that your death gave us life, abundant life now and eternal life forever. As you instructed your disciples, we too receive this bread in remembrance of you. Brothers and sisters, let us eat the bread together. And in the same way, as we take this cup, representing your blood poured out from a splintered cross, we realize that you were the supreme sacrifice for all our sin, past, present, and future. Because of your blood shed for us and your body broken for us, we can be free from the power and penalty of sin. Thank you for your victory over death. You took the death that we deserved. You took our punishment. Your pain was indeed our gain. And today we remember and celebrate the precious gift of life you gave us through the blood that you spilled. Brothers and sisters, let us take the cup and drink together. Or more, 
Your grace is ever shown Lord, I want to love you With a heart that's ever true I want to give you all my life Surrender myself to you You alone can change me You alone can set me I finally found new meaning In my life a new beginning A reason to believe because of you I'd like to feel your presence Every single day Let your assurance fill me Cast all my doubts away And there may be times when I am lost In the woods alone Like a wandering child Searching for his way back home But I know that you are with me You give me strength when I am weary Though I fall a million times or more Your grace is ever shown Lord, I want to love you with a heart that's ever true I want to give you all my life Surrender myself to you You alone can change me You alone set me free for I finally found new meaning in my life a new beginning a reason to believe because of you Lord I want to love you with a heart that's ever true I want to give you Surrender myself to you You alone can change me You alone can set me free For I finally found new meaning In my life a new beginning A reason to believe Because of you How to send our offerings by bank deposit or online banking or mobile wallet app GCash. Please send your offerings to BPI account number 19910011235. Kindly email a screenshot of your offering to debbie.orogo at gci.org and or doris.panubay at gci.org 
or send screenshot of your offering via Facebook Messenger to Deb Season Orogo and Doris Madubai. Please include your name and church area so that your offering will be credited to your local church. Go and make known the mystery of the gospel. Keep alert and pray at all times. Even when times get difficult and the way is not clear, God is truly by your side. Draw strength from God's power and so stand firm against all that would corrupt you. And may God arm you with truth and righteousness. May Christ Jesus give you words of spirit and life. And may the Holy Spirit draw you near to God's presence and bless you with honor and grace. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen.